information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy. And I'm Zach. And this is our second episode for A to Z Running. Episode two. Episode two. If you missed the first episode, we talked about thriving in the running community. And for so many reasons, we thought it would be fitting for this episode to talk about struggle. And because we have so much to get to, let's just go ahead and dive right in. So let's get things started with the world of running, as we always do. And before we get to our favorite part of the update, let's go ahead and talk about Elliot Kipchoge. Yeah, that was a pretty defining moment in running history. So a day before this historical accomplishment on Elliot's Instagram, he said, I don't know what my limits are, but I would like to go there. And I just love that. Wow. It's like such a cool idea of chasing after our dreams and going to the edge of ourselves. It's even better that he also accomplished the goal. Yes. <laughs> and then he had said that the day before. So highly motivating. So just to put this in perspective, uh, he ran the pace that I ran for my 800 meter PR. So 159.40 for the full marathon, as many, if not all of you know, and that's somewhere just under 434 mile pace. Now, um, one other thing we should probably say about that, and it, you know, it can't you can't really talk about the event without naming it. It was the, correct me if I say the company's name wrong, Ineos 159 Challenge. Not to be confused with the Nike Breaking 2 Challenge or project because obviously this is not the same thing. So um, clearly a historical thing, as you said, Andy. That's so true. But I did want to just mention because it's really an odd thing when how people frame something like this. So everyone keeps writing about and talking about how like everyone said this wasn't possible. It's not possible for man to break two. Um and even like some, you know, some Australian thing that Runners World cited some research on the topic to find out, like, is it possible based off historical data and improvements over time and such? And they predicted something like 2032 would be the next potential chance that a human could do that. And obviously, it's not yet 2032. But I, I did want to just make one comment. Every time we talk about that, we're talking about it in the context of how people have run marathons in records legal marathon conditions which is not the same thing as what they did with this challenge no it was a very unique situation yeah when you can control every single factor to the the most optimized position it's going to change the potential outcome of things so i don't want to belittle his accomplishment or the project's success because it, that's an incredible accomplishment and success um but it also isn't necessarily the answer to can man ever break sub two in a marathon. It's the answer to can a human being run, run sub two in a marathon in the best possible conditions with the most highly advanced technology available at the time with the most amount of help. So you get what I'm trying to say. Um, it was incredible. Uh, but I'm also still waiting to see when that happens on like the Berlin Marathon course, which I don't think is that long off in the future either. So. No. And I have to say about the whole idea of this team surrounding Kipchoge, I actually really like that because yeah. he did not do it on his own and he would tell you that. Like, so there was cool. something like 42 yeah, elites it was, it was that, about 40 elites yeah. that helped pace him so it was a group event and i i really like the idea of breaking barriers by forming teams yeah and i gotta say it it, it would be cool obviously to be elliot in this moment that would be an incredible thing but i don't know if i ever want to try to run a marathon any faster than i have run already and i don't think i may run too many more of those in my life more on that by the way in a minute when we actually talk about the chicago marathon uh but i will say this to be one of those pacers and they're like rotating in and out throughout the entire experience like that would be so cool how how much fun would that have been so and it was a lot of fun you could see it because of how much they all enjoyed it and and just the you know the things going on so great Props to everyone involved in that incredible thing. And I'm sure we'll continue to hear about it in a lot of different ways for uh, some time now because that's kind of the nature of that kind of accomplishment. So let's jump right on to our favorite topic for the world of running this week, and that is the Chicago Marathon. Um, let me go ahead and get it started so that I can actually try to say her name. 
Uh, most notable accomplishment in the event was Bridget Kaske's world record marathon time. Yes, you heard it. World record, an actual official world record, breaking Paula Radcliffe's 2003 time with an astounding 214 and change uh, over a minute off of the previous world record. Wow. That's just insane to me. It's amazing. So to give a little extra perspective on that, 215 is the considered the Olympic Trials A standard for the men's marathon. So if a man can run under 215 in the U.S., then he can get a free trip to the Olympic Trials. Woo! Yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, one other thing at the front of the race was the men's race. Everyone was talking about it because it was just crazy. The top three guys finished within a handful of seconds from each other, which means, yes, indeed, the marathon came down to a final kick. Ouch. Which no marathoner ever wants to actually do. And those of you who haven't run on the Chicago Marathon course, it's uphill a little bit at the end. It's, it's kind of painful. Uphill kick. <laughs> I mean, it's a really fast course, but it is uphill in that list, last little bit. Yeah, one of the biggest hills on the course is when you hit about 600 meters, 400 meters to go. So to race that, have it come down to a kick, I'm sure that that was <laughs> a lot of fun for them. I really want to mention Parker Stinson. Yeah, Parker. Woohoo. We have kind of a hometown connection to him. He doesn't live in West Michigan, but he's been training there, like the Rockford area, for some time because his coach is Dathan Ritzenhain, who is a three time um, Olympian, and he's our hometown hero here in West Michigan. So Parker Stinson also ran the American record at the Riverbank Run, the 25K, and that was here in Grand Rapids, Michigan as well. And at the Chicago Marathon, he ran the World Olympic Standard, two hours, 10 minutes, and 53 seconds. That's flying. So that puts him on the world rankings, and that's going to be very important moving forward as they've changed some of the qualifications for world championships and Olympics that now significantly weigh on the ranking system more than just a time standard and so that's that's an important accomplishment, and props to Parker, and we'll uh, see how he does in Atlanta in February, and certainly good luck to him. Now, we need to also commemorate and give a shout-out to another who will be in Atlanta competing in February in the Olympic Marathon Trials. A props to our very own A to Z Running's own Andy Ripley and her <laughs> 243 Olympic Trials Qualifier Marathon Performance. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, love. I'm super excited about this, if you didn't just notice. So I was hoping, and I was hoping to keep it secret, but it didn't end up being so secret that that was my goal. It was a really big... It's hard to keep that secret when we actually said it I know. all over our blog. And I... <laughs> I I was very resistant to that. That was that kind of pushing me towards vocalizing my goals. And I do think it, it helped me, but it also was something I had to process through as I as I was nervous and getting ready for the races because it was a 12-minute marathon PR for me. 12 minutes. <laughs> Granted, I have only run one other marathon, and that was a year after my first child was born. And now I have um, 21 months since my... Second son was born, so I had a little bit more time to get ready. Hmm. So let's just keep having kids, and then you'll keep running faster. <laughs> no. No, no, no. 12 minutes no, for you. every kid. <laughs> that, that would be something else. I'll just need a couple more, and then you can catch up with Bridget. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to give a little bit of a recap of my race. Yeah, tell us about how the, how that go, Andy. I forgot my watch. Uh, at the start, I kind of realized, well, before the start, as soon as we came out of the hotel, I realized I didn't have my watch. We discussed it. I decided I wasn't going to wear the watch because I could have gone up and gotten it. But because the GPS is wonky and I've run my last two races without a watch, I thought maybe I'd just go without. Yeah. So it was kind of funny when you were like, hey, I just realized I forgot my watch. And I had to take the gamble of, do I tell her to go get it or do I tell her she'll be just fine, knowing that whichever scenario, if she decides that she would have liked to have it and didn't take it, then that's on me. Ew. So I took the risk and I said, oh, you don't need it. And I was worried about regretting that. Well, I have to say, that I don't know if I would have gotten paces during it, but I did go out with the wrong pack. 
And it was the 610 pack, which I have to run 618s in order to qualify for the Olympic trials. That's what I was planning to do and maybe go like 615 to, to 618. But I started out kind of quick for me. Yeah, you were on pace for like 240. For the- which would be insane um, for what I've done before. So I started like feeling the hurt pretty early on. It was mile 16 where I started feeling my quad and there was separation in the group because the girls going 6'10 totally dropped me. And a lot, actually there's a few of us that were dropped at that point. But as I was running and feeling this pain in my quad, I had to like lift my knee each time. I had to think about it. This motion that I had been doing training, it wasn't so simple anymore. And I had to really focus on putting one leg in front of another. And I realized that God had been preparing me to struggle and suffer in the past few years. I know it sounds dramatic, but it's true. Like there's been a lot of struggle in my life and he's been with me, but I realized during the race, like he had been preparing me. It didn't hurt any less, but it mattered more that I was able to endure and keep and keep moving on because I really did want to give up. So, Zach, how did your race unfold? Well, not as much excitement coming from me here. Um, it, so, I, you know, I, I was also trying to go for the standard, which for the men was 219. And I definitely went for it in the smartest way that I thought I could at the time, which is go conservative, even um, a little bit too slow at the half, just a little bit, which was fine. Um, you know, if you're running a good marathon, then you should be able to buy back a little bit of time if you need to. Um, but that's, of course, assuming that I could actually run the entire 26 miles. Um, definitely was was starting to get aggressive in the middle of the race. And I do think this is this is a tendency that I have, and it sometimes is a bad thing, and it sometimes is a good thing. Um, but I like to be in control in a race, and Andy knows this well in terms of just what I prefer to do when I'm racing and competing. Um, I like to control, and so I oftentimes will run near the front if not actually leading the race, and I'm in, entirely comfortable doing that for long periods of time. But what ends up happening in a situation like this is I'm basically taking on the burden of – pacing the group that I was with um, and the wind and there it was, was and there was a lot of windy. wind so I don't know if that actually had any kind of negative effects long term on the race but it certainly made it uh, challenging um, and just uh, it required a lot of focus in the middle of the race there the group started to fragment somewhere near half marathon and no one really wanted to lead that was also about the windiest part of the race so I kept just pushing back to the front and picking the pace back up and found that I was I was probably a little too aggressive in the middle of the race there. Um, so then, you know, brought it around to mile 20, and my whole goal was get to mile 20 and then give it everything that's left. Um, so I, I, I tried one more time. It was basically, you know, if I don't... If I don't go for it now, I'm not going to hit the time. There's no way that I could hit the time if I just settled. So I needed to pick it up or I needed to to get a little bit stronger. And in doing so, it only lasted for about a mile or two and then started to fall apart. And so by mile 22, I was I was starting to go out the back door and never came back. Didn't you have some data like from your heart rate monitor or something? Oh, yeah. So my heart rate started spiking right about that time, which tends to happen when you when you hit the threshold when you cross the line and um, whether it's the actual wall or just um, just getting a little bit too high over that line um, it's really hard to come back from that especially in the marathon some some races you can if it's earlier on but in the marathon if you cross the line late in the race there's really no way to bring it back so as I was slowing down my heart rate was still um, spiking on me and so I just couldn't I couldn't settle back down Now, I think that if nothing else, um, you know, as we as we reflect just then on the race on the whole, um, that's a good spectrum between the two of us. You know, we we wanted for A to Z running. Our goal was to try to get both of us to the Olympic trials, have that that shared experience like that. Um, but you know, this this is an interesting and unique opportunity because not only can we talk about the success and the excitement for Andy's experience, we can also talk about the struggle and the failure in my experience and. It's important. You know, that's the nature of the beast when we talk about running. And that's a large part of what's fueling then our motivation for the main topic we want to discuss this week. And I think if nothing else, everyone listening can relate to something we're sharing here, where whether you've achieved a goal and you're on a high um, in a recent performance, if not the Chicago Marathon yourself, or whether you've missed something, you've fallen short, 
um, or whether you just have felt the struggle, regardless of both situations, things aren't easy. So we want to bring that back to our main topic, talk about the struggle. If you've been a distance runner for any length of time, then you know, like all the rest of us do, that running is a struggle. Mm -hmm. And as we think about how to break down the topic, and especially to do so in a way that can prove helpful to others as we're talking through it ourselves, we've come to two conclusions. That in order to deal with the struggle in an effective way, we have to look at it from two dynamics. The first is to embrace the struggle, and the second is to overcome the struggle. When we think about embracing struggle as a runner, we're really talking about learning to accept hardship and learning to thrive amidst the pain. Thinking about, you know, death and taxes, that's the guarantee, right? Everyone always says death and taxes are your guarantee in life. However, personally, I always like to refute that because one, you can easily avoid taxes, not legally, but you certainly can avoid paying taxes. And the other one is, if you believe the Bible as we do, then there are some people who didn't die according to certain stories. So I'm not sure that you can actually say death is a guarantee either. Which means it brings us to what I like to say the only, the single only guarantee that every human in any recorded history can attest to is pain. And for runners, that's especially true. Which brings us then to overcoming the struggle and learning how to, in this sense, lessen the burden. It's really all about knowing that you can control and knowing how to do so effectively. So as you might guess, a lot of what we're going to talk about here points back to our recent experience training for and competing in the Chicago Marathon. So we'll certainly reference that quite a bit. But to get things started, Andy, how have you learned to embrace and overcome the struggle? Wow, that's a heavy question. So I've had a lot of obstacles I've struggled with, um, injury, self-doubt, and an aggressive timetable even for Chicago Marathon. My body hurt in some way or another the entire training cycle. I had to overcome the weaknesses that caused my labrum tears, the instability and pain in my hips themselves, and the mental part of that is difficult because I have this like imposter syndrome, right? Like I'm going to have to run this massive PR to hit this dream goal on a shortened timetable with reduced mileage. So I had a hard time wrapping my head around that. And then I usually like to keep my goals to myself. And this whole A to Z running, I've put myself out there. And um, I think as far as the overcoming piece of it and embracing it, I have just surrounded people who have a lot of grace and who have encouraged me and supported me. And they like dreaming with me and hoping with me and cheering me on. And my relationship with these people isn't going to change based on my performance. No doubt. And uh, you really hit something that's so keen here, which is you said grace, Andy. And uh, when we think about one of the most important lessons learned by this shared struggle that so many of us experience um, is the importance of having grace for other people in the midst of how they're struggling as well. Because you never really know. You never really know exactly what someone else is experiencing uh, and whatever the spectrum. So I guess my tangible process and my progress through the struggle was finding out weaknesses both physically and emotionally. I work in these areas and then invite others in. So endurance rehabilitation with Adam, uh, that helped me tremendously in the physical aspect of strengthening my weak Um, my weak hips, my glutes, my hamstrings, all of it, loosening it up, getting better mobility. But then also that piece I mentioned earlier about the community that I've surrounded myself in, uh, the emotional piece of it. Um, I've also gone through some other external emotional things with a friend who has a TBI and her dream is to run again. And I'm just, I I love her so much and I want to see that realized and praying for her. And then also, with my pregnancies, my pregnancies were, were dangerous and they were hard. So all of these things I'm processing, all of these things are part of the struggle. And there is manifestation in my physical body too, because I wasn't able to run during pregnancy. 
Um, and I had to take two months off for the hip labrum this past spring. So all of this struggle, all of this, I have been surrounded by experts, by friends, by family, by Zach. And then some of you through social media, that support has been overwhelming. And that's probably a very keen dynamic in the struggle in general, which is just simply that so many things outside of the actual physical effort of running affect the experience of running and how we struggle with that. And Andy, you were just mentioning circumstances that were really not even involving you directly in some cases, things that are going through that other people are going through, um, whether it's people you care about or things that you're intimately involved in in some way. And those things influence it too. And then in the same sense, the kinds of things that help us overcome struggle can also include external factors that don't necessarily have anything to do with the running or the sport itself. And so even even as I'm thinking about this and we're talking about uh, struggle in terms of how we as runners experience struggle, but you can't separate that from just the, the message, the greater message of just life in general and how we struggle in life as well. So I guess that kind of loops into the few key takeaways I have as, as I've processed this over the years. And um, in some ways I was kind of known for in college as being um, kind of a philosophizer with a lot of these things. And so I would say things to my teammates, you know, like trying to encourage and support and inspire people and stuff. And I would say things and people would be like, that's a really weird thing that you just said, you know, <laughs> trying to like say something deep and it, was, it didn't always make sense. And it wasn't always Andy knows. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking at that level about running a lot, and I still do. And and so in a large part, it's kind of influenced how I think through this topic especially. Um, and, and one of the big takeaways is that it's important to become in some ways intimate with our pain, um, both in and out of the sport, but especially the physical side of it. Um, because if we don't if we don't truly understand the kind of pain that we're experiencing in a given moment, um, then it's very hard to understand what that means for how we should respond to it, how should we should actually try to react to that, whether it's an acceptable pain or whether it's problematic and otherwise. So that kind of that kind of intimacy thing plays out so hugely in performances then, because when you get in the marathon and something's going wrong, it's important to know, like, is this something that I should expect and predict or is there something happening here that I might need to react to and actually you know, change something about what I'm doing? Um, and that's key. So saying that, I've got just a few points that I want to make. Um, how, in my experience and, and in my own efforts to overcome struggle, um, so on the side of embracing it, certainly there's value there, but there's also some things that we can do to try to actually get past it, and I appreciate some of your points too, Andy. So the things that I would mention are simply, um, first and foremost, is just prioritizing. You know, Because, as you were saying, Andy, so many of the things that influence our pain and struggle involve external factors. In the same sense, the external factors in our life need to be well for our running to truly be free and well. Mm -hmm. And I'll just categorize, you know, simply, I think for all people, these the, these three dynamics following priorities, um, spiritual, relational, and internal well-being or harmony, I think are the first things that must be in place for you to really truly be able to run freely and to train well. Um, and when those things are, you know, the, when the priorities are in that order, um, then things can much more smoothly fall into line. Um, and I think there's so many ways that that plays out, but definitely whatever, you know, whatever it looks like for you, you, you can tell, you can feel when things are not right in your priorities. Um, it, it makes everything else harder. Yeah. So in that kind of a sense, um, one point of advice that I always come back to is just cut, cutting the fat. Uh, too much in our life vies for our attention, and most of it is entirely worthless in terms of our spiritual, relational, and internal well-being. Ripe Netflix. It wasn't that hard. It was so hard. I love Netflix. We, and there's some good stuff that you can, I mean, it's great yeah. to relax and to laugh and to be engrossed in another world for a time, but we were spending a little too much time with our Netflix. Yeah, we like so many others, and I, I don't know your own experience as you're listening to this, but I know from just talking with friends and coworkers and family and such, so many of us like to spend a lot of time watching our show, right? our show. What's your show right now? Everyone's got a show right now. Um, we don't actually have a show anymore. Uh, we, we don't watch more than at most about one episode of something a week. 
And that's only if we don't have other things that we need to do, especially for the A to Z running side of our life right now. So um, what, you know, what, what was that for us? That was um, something that was kind of nice and relaxing, but nice and relaxing for a few minutes would always turn into nice and relaxing for three or four episodes. Yeah. And that's not healthy. So uh, we, yeah, we cut that out and that was a, you know, I thank you, Andy, because that was your initiative early on. And before we had other things we were trying to replace it with, we just felt like it wasn't a good balance. So that's a good example. And I just really think that um, there are a great many things in the digital sphere that are specifically built for and designed to try to captivate your attention as much as possible for as long as possible, as often as possible. And so look at that, examine that, and then think about, okay, are there some things that I can cut out to give myself more space? So on that uh, transitioning over here then to the training side specifically, I would definitely always say that training smarter makes a huge difference in actually overcoming struggle in your running. Um, and what I mean by that, I'm not talking about the work harder, not smarter, or work smarter, not harder thing. Um, no, but specifically, I'm actually talking about understanding your training and knowing how to train well for your goals and for the things you're trying to achieve. Um, and by the way, I just mentioned that the whole concept of like running is essentially it's like this perpetual experiment on your body. You know, I'm trying to find out if I put this shoe on, will it break my foot or will it make me feel better while I run for 20 miles? Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of a dangerous thing when you think about it. You, you, there's a cost benefit here. And so I think the more we can know about it and the more we can know about how to do it well, um, the better off we are. I do want to interject just a second because when we talk about training smarter, I think a great example is that Zach, his mileage is like double of my, like my mileage. So I had to learn how to understand myself and my long-term health and what I was able to be capable of. The fact that I made it to the start line of Chicago Marathon was because we modified my training specifically for my health. Yeah, listen, it was it was two seasons in a row that you were trying to build volume and every time you got to a certain level, that's when things would break down for you and you'd get you'd get hurt. So uh, we, we looked at that and said, OK, that's not an acceptable way to do things over and over. So let's look for a better route. Um, yeah. And there's there's a lot of different directions that takes. Um, so I will just mention here, this is kind of the path that we're really pursuing right now. We've we've set it quietly to a number of people, but we're currently formulating our consultation services um, that we'll begin to offer for individuals, um, just especially on this topic, um, oriented around helping other runners understand their training well and how they can pursue their goals. So the last couple here just kind of coincide with one another. One is just emphasizing routine. When we think about our bodies and what they need to thrive physically, um, routine is and rhythm in that same sense is very important. So learning to fine tune your routine. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of science out there about like certain things that are best at certain times of day. Um, the science is often also conflicted though. And really what it comes down to is you got to find out what's working for you and your schedule and then try to stick to it as best as you can. And if you've had injuries like me, for example, going and consulting a PT or going to endurance rehabilitation is a really good idea because it can help establish your routine and find those areas of weakness that you need to work on during those daily routines. Yeah, someone like Adam's really great at looking at your physical situation and saying, here's something that your body needs and here's how often it needs it. So the last one then is just knowing yourself um, in a general sense. Uh, some of it is your expectations and goals. You know, having reasonable expectations is important because if I went, if I showed up in the Chicago Marathon and said, you know what, um, I, today I want to run 2:15, um, I wasn't going to be able to run 2:15. That wasn't going to happen. So that could have just been a problematic thing. But even just in day to day, understanding my body and my limitations, um, and then also looking for and pursuing incremental gains toward those big goals that I might have. Um, and that just really kind of all ties back together to what I was talking about and some of those other points. What we're really looking for are the things that we can do to influence our struggle and how to overcome it and in areas where we can't overcome it to embrace it. Well, that should do it for the episode. Andy, where are we going next? 
next week's episode, we'll be focusing on the idea of knowing ourselves and understanding and pursuing our goals well. Great. Well, if you feel like the ideas discussed here are helpful, share the podcast with a runner friend. And remember, you can find us on lots of social media places via A to Z running. And as always, the best way to stay on point with A to Z running is to visit A to Z running dot com and click subscribe. I'm Zach. And I'm Andy. And thanks for tuning in.